Good morning, everybody. Do you believe that? The, if more of him means less of you, take everything. Is that your heart? Awesome song, but that's, to the, that's the text of today. King Nebuchadnezzar had everything. And then he has this dream. You know, God on a global scale, um, he has already, we, we saw it last week, we've seen it in previous weeks, God rules in the affairs of men on a global scale. At a personal level, everything you are is because of his good hand. We'll get it. I, I don't know who's teaching next week. Um, I should, but I don't. And it might even be the week following. But in, in chapter 5, um, Daniel is talking to Nebuchadnezzar's son in chapter 5. And he says this, But when his heart, meaning his dad's heart, when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened so that he dealt proudly, he was brought down from his kingly throne and his glory was taken from him. And then in verse 23 at the very end, God in whose hand is your breath and whose all your ways. God's hand gives us every breath we take. All of our ways, all that we have, all we don't have, all, all of our influence, our family, our friends, everything is because of his hand, according to scripture. Down to the personal level for me and for you. That's today's message in a nutshell. Let's pray and then we'll get into the word. God, we are desperate for you to teach, desperate for your spirit to move. Lord, I praise you for who you are, how you love us, how you call us how you empower us to walk in ways that bring you glory. But God, we are weak people. I'm a weak man. We'll read today that the king, the ruler of all the known world, was weak before you, in desperate need of you, in desperate need for his eyes to be turned to you. So Father, I pray that that would be our heart this morning, that wherever we're at, whether it's in need or in need of nothing, that we would know clearly that our eyes need to look to you, that you are our every breath. Everything we have is you. Everything we are is you. Lord, help us to be a people that acknowledge that personally and pray and beg you to move like that in our nation and in the world. Your kingdom, Lord, is not of this world. We praise you for that. Thank you that we are citizens of heaven. But God, you've left us right where we are. Whatever town we are in, you've left us for a reason. So Lord, help us to be salt and light for the people around us. Do as only you can do in our midst, Lord. For your glory, for your fame, and nothing else. In Jesus' name, amen. Daniel chapter 4, stand with me if you would. We're going to read verse 28 through the end of the chapter of Daniel chapter 4. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. And the king answered and said, Is not this great Babylon which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence for the glory of my majesty? While the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you, and you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and you shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. Immediately the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar, he was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven until his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers and his nails were like bird's claws. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say to him, What have you done? 
At the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and splendor returned to me. My counselors and my Lord sought me, and I was established in my kingdom, and still more greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, for all of his works are right, and his ways are just, and those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Be seated, please. A couple of preambles. I usually give you a handout sheet. Mia culpa, you didn't get one this morning. So if you have a pen, you can keep track. Proverbs 11.2 says, When pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with the humble is wisdom. Micah 6.8. Um, Ron, if you're watching, one of your favorite verses, one of my favorite verses as well. He has told you, O man, what is good? What does the Lord require of you? But to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. And then 1 Peter 5, 6, Humble yourselves therefore into the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Those words applied to King Nebuchadnezzar. They apply to us. Verses 28 to 30 of chapter 4. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar and at the end of 12 months, stop right there. God's already told him what's going to happen. Daniel has interpreted the dream. That was last week. So the king knew, this is going to happen to me. My stump is going to be bound. The roots are going to be left until I know that God rules the kingdom of men. King Nebuchadnezzar knew that. Twelve months later, he's walking on the roof of his palace, which is a dangerous place, obviously, for a king to be. (laughs) There are other stories in the word about the king walking on the top of their palace and thinking about themselves. Here, 12 months have passed. God is gracious. He could have executed his judgment as soon as Daniel gave the interpretation, but God waited 12 months. Here's the challenge for us, though, for me anyway. I tend to forget. When the pain is passed, when the fear is gone, and life kind of attenuates out, and I get on a steady roll, all of a sudden, the real me comes out. And I think that's the way it was with Nebuchadnezzar. The real him comes out. He's walking on the roof of the palace 12 months later in verse 30. And the king answered. Somebody asked the king a question. We don't know who. We don't know what the question was. But somebody asked King Nebuchadnezzar a question. And the king answered and said... Is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my power, mighty power, as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? I did some research this week. Nebuchadnezzar did some amazing stuff, in human terms, amazing stuff. First of all, he conquered all these lands. So he was a great warrior, great strategy, stratistician, (laughs) Bibbidi. He had a lot going on when it came to conquering foreign lands. God used him for that. In fact, if we backed up a couple of chapters, remember there in in Luke chapter 21, I think it's verse 24, Jesus said, he was talking about the end times, and he said, all this needs to happen until the times of the Gentiles is fulfilled. The times of the Gentiles started with Nebuchadnezzar. God gave him a dream. And Nebuchadnezzar is the head of gold and all these other kingdoms would come after him until the end comes and all that statue is shattered by a new kingdom that's never going to have an end. The Lord Jesus set it up. So this Nebuchadnezzar was the times of the Gentiles that extended all the way until Jesus was teaching and he said, this is going to continue until I come back. So we're still living in the times of the Gentiles that started with this guy. So lots of conquering, but it was all God's hand that was allowing him to conquer. Moved to Babylon, incredible stuff was happening in this Babylon. There were multiple, multiple buildings. In fact, archaeologists say that the majority of the buildings that are still found in ancient Babylon have an inscription that talk about King Nebuchadnezzar building it. So he had great insight into how to build and what things to build and and the pomp and circumstances all over the place. He built multiple walls, two walls around the city to protect it. The outer wall 
was wide enough for two chariots to pass each other on the top of the wall. This was a big, big, well-fortified city. One of his wives um, says, I miss my homeland that had mountains. So he builds mountains on top of the palace. And the Greeks considered it one of the Modern, one of the marvels of the ancient world was the hanging gardens in Babylon. That was Nebuchadnezzar's idea to satisfy a desire of his wife. And they had hydraulic systems that were unheard of at that time. Hydraulic systems to get the water up to the top and water all of these hanging gardens. So over and over and over again, God has used Nebuchadnezzar to do amazing stuff. And it went to Nebuchadnezzar's head. Look at all of this Babylon that my mighty power has built. Look at me. Look at my creation. He had, in human terms, it was all his. It was his idea. In God's terms, Nebuchadnezzar, you're failing to recognize that I'm the one that put you there. I'm the one that put you in place, Nebuchadnezzar, according to Jeremiah, a servant of God to bring judgment against a nation of Israel that had turned their backs on God. He was a tool that God used for God's purposes. And everything Nebuchadnezzar had, all the success, all the accolades, all the stuff was God's hand. And Nebuchadnezzar did not recognize a bit of it. Are you like that? Am I like that with the things in my life? I'm not a great man like Nebuchadnezzar. I don't think anybody in here is a Nebuchadnezzar. I'm pretty confident there was only one of those guys. But whatever you've got, whatever I've got, my failure to recognize that that's God's good hand puts me in a dangerous spot. It put Nebuchadnezzar in a dangerous spot. Verse 31. While the words were still in the king's mouth there fell a voice from heaven. How many times in scripture has a voice from heaven been heard? Not many. When God speaks audibly from the heavens, it's a big deal. Something big is happening. And God audibly with a voice from heaven talks to Nebuchadnezzar and says, Oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. That had to be terrifying to him. To you it is spoken voice from heaven, God Almighty speaking. What did that sound like? I wonder. Then he says that the kingdom has departed from you and you shall be driven from among men and all the things that God said were going to happen were happening immediately according to scripture. So I thought about um, there's a um, Maslow is the guy's name. I'm not going to sit here and talk about Maslow and his hierarchy of needs. I am going to talk about the needs though. So there's this basic need that we all have that regardless of what you think about Maslow, I think we can agree to there, there being some basic things that human beings need. At the bottom tier is we need food and water and shelter. That's the bottom tier. The next tier up We need, I'll just walk them for you. Should have given you a handout. Safety and security is the second tier up. So you need to have a safe environment, secure environment. Then there's friendship and relationships is the third. And the next one is prestige and a sense of accomplishment. And then the top one, some people call it self-actualization. Some people just say, well, it's it's the achievements that you do. There's a story, whether it's true or not, I don't know. Um, Neil Armstrong, when he landed on the moon, I mean, where do you go from there? You're the first human being to put a foot on the moon. How do you go up from there? And he was depressed after that. And God brought him through that. But he had achieved this greatest accomplishment that in his mind he could achieve. He had done it. What next? So King Nebuchadnezzar has all of this stuff. And he's standing at the pinnacle when he's on the roof of his building. And he says, look at all of this. My mighty hand, everything. He's got all the food he could want. Whatever he wants to eat, he eats. Whatever he wants to drink, he drinks. Whoever he wants to be his friend, they're his friend. Whoever he doesn't want to breathe anymore is killed. 
He exalts who he wants to exalt. He humbles who he wants to humble. He's got complete authority in the land to do whatever he wants to do. And he's accountable to nobody in human terms. And he builds whatever he wants to build. He puts in money and investments into whatever he wants to. So he's on the pinnacle while he's on the roof of his palace. And God says, I'm going to take every single one of those away from you. I'm going to drive you away from men. Friendship, relationship, gone. You're going to eat grass. Even, even the basic building block that we all need, God truncated that to a third. You're not just going to eat to survive. You're going to eat barely enough to survive. For seven years, you're going to eat grass. You're going to be covered in the dew of heaven. You're going to be driven from men. Your hair's going to grow. Eagle's feathers are 16 to 22 inches. His hair gets long. His fingernails and his toenails are bird claws. Probably went around with no clothes on. Seven years, this guy is like a beast in the field. Why? Because he was proud. God doesn't take pride lightly. There's one thing that Maslow and folks like him miss, and it's the most important thing. It's in Jeremiah chapter, tw- chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me. (sighs) That I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24 Memorize those verses. Don't let those verses slip past you. They are the foundation, not only the foundation to this hierarchy of our needs, but they encompass that hierarchy of needs. If you're at the top and you don't have Jeremiah chapter 9, you got nothing. You're a king walking on the top of the roof and you got nothing. Ann and I, I wish I was here. She's not feeling good this morning. We were, uh, we were stationed in Texas in a town that I won't mention the name because some of you might have been there and some of you might live there now, but we called it the armpit of the world. We hated this little town. We lived in a single wide trailer with cinder block holding up our couch. The doors didn't close all the way. The windows didn't seal. Dust blew in one window and out the other window. Our heater didn't work. Our air conditioning didn't work. And at the time... I was in the Air Force, and there were no automated systems back then. It was all paper. They lost my finances. So they didn't pay me. Air Force didn't pay me. I went to my boss. He sent me to my first sergeant. First sergeant said, we'll move you into the dorms. We'll give you a meal card. I said, what about my wife? And you you know what he said. We didn't issue you a wife. We'll give you a dorm room, and we'll give you a meal card. Your wife's on her own. So where do you think I stayed? with my wife in the single wide trailer, we would flip a coin to see who would go get the, the crackers. That's all we could afford was crackers from the kitchen and run back to the bedroom and cover up again. We bought plastic bags to cover our windows so that the wind would stay out. It was miserable. And God taught us his grace is sufficient. In that, he is my God. He provides That time was horrible for us, but he provided. He was good. We have a very comfortable house now. Comfortable living, comfortable cars. That's his good hand. If he takes them tomorrow, I want my heart to be, God, you are a good God. What I have is stuff. I want to be Jeremiah 9, where I remember Let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me. I want to understand my God. I want to know my God. I want to be known by my God. That I understand and know God, that he is the Lord who practices steadfast love and justice and righteousness in the earth. Because in those things, this is God's words. God is speaking. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. He delights 
in us when we do that. He delights in us knowing that you're the only one, God, that counts. Everything else, literally, it's going to happen. Everything you can see, look around you. It's going to burn one day. It's going to be destroyed. We are it. He's taking us home. He's not taking my stuff. He's not taking my home. He's not taking my car. He's not taking my bank account. He's not taking my pool. He's not taking a single wide trailer. He's not even taking the cinder block that was holding up the couch. He's taking none of that stuff. It's all going to burn. The only thing that counts is our relationship with him. And Nebuchadnezzar needed to learn that. And we need to learn that. It needs to be our breath according to the next chapter. Lord, I want to breathe for your glory. I want to breathe with the understanding that everything I have, whether it's a lot or a little, is your good hand. I don't need anything but you. Those songs we sang, those weren't just words. We need nothing but him. Nothing but him. Everything else should pale in comparison. And if it doesn't, I pray God would deal with you until it does. I pray that he would deal with me until it does. Lord, if everything I have needs to be lost so that I can draw more closely to you, then let me lose it all. Is that your heart? That's a tough spot to be in. Nebuchadnezzar, the more you have, the harder it is. Nebuchadnezzar had it all. It was a tough spot for Nebuchadnezzar. And God did something drastic to get his attention. For seven years, he was like a beast in the field. He had no place to go. He didn't have a palace. He didn't have splendor. He didn't have stuff. He didn't have fancy food. He didn't have wine to drink. He didn't have servants that were waiting on him. He literally was a beast in the field eating grass. Soaked with the dew of heaven. Nobody cared about him. They probably mocked him when they saw him. Hey, king, nice robe there, buddy. Verse 34. At the end of those days, even God's judgment had a time frame. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar is the first leader in the time of the Gentiles. God took drastic action to get his attention. And I praise God for the way Nebuchadnezzar responded. Verse 34, at the end of those days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven. For seven years, he had probably been staring at the grass and the dirt and the rocks. Thinking, man, my hair keeps getting in the way of my eyes. My fingernails keep getting stuck in the crevices in the rock. I sure am hungry. I wonder if he wanted bacon. I mean, if, if I was eating grass for seven years, I think all I would think about is bacon. I'd think about Wilbur. <laughs> he had nothing. This, I, I cannot imagine nothing but grass for seven years. And instead of thinking about what food he's going to have, at the end of the period, he turns his eyes to heaven. Not to what my meal is going to be, not, to, not back to the old comfort things of what got me in trouble in the first place. He turned his eyes to heaven. And my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High. He had talked to Daniel repeatedly, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, about their God. Your God is this. Your God is that. And here he's saying, I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion, here's what God said, you are going to endure until you do this. And this is, this is Nebuchadnezzar, his reason returns to him. He looks to heaven and he says exactly what God said. Until you get to here, you're going to stay like a madman. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. 
His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. He does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. In heaven, he has his way. On earth, he has his way. No one can still his hand. No one can say, what do you think you're doing? They lost my finance records. God, what do you think you're doing? I'm, I wish y'all could have seen my wife's face when I said, I, I found us a place, she showed up, and I took her into a single wide trailer in the dumpiest trailer park you could ever imagine with the seediest people around us you could ever imagine. The one I told you about was the one that we signed a rent on. The first one that I showed that her, we, she, she started crying. She said, I, I can't live here. I mean, there's holes in the floor. We'll fall through. He rules it all. Heaven, he rules. Earth, he rules. The inhabitants of heaven, he rules. No one can say to him, what do you think you're doing? I don't care where you're at. I don't care what your circumstances. I don't care how tired you are, how broke you are, how fearful you are. I don't care. You cannot say to God, what do you think you're doing? Don't you see what's going on in my life, God? Don't you care? How dare us counsel God on how he should respond? He is sovereign. There is none like him. What he chooses to do, he is going to do. Our job is to remember that he is good. He is gracious. He is loving. He always provides. He never, ever, ever, ever will leave us or abandon us. That's in Hebrews. Never, ever, ever. Three times in the Greek. Never, no, never, no, never, ever, ever will I leave you or abandon you. That's his promise. Doesn't matter how hard your life gets or how good it gets. He is sovereign. He rules. Verse 36. At the same time, my reason returned to me. So the same time that his reason returns to him, he looks to heaven and he acknowledges that God is sovereign. At the same time that happens, verse 36, my reason returned to me and for the glory of my kingdom, uh uh-oh, is he in trouble again? For the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and my splendor returned to me. My counselors and my Lord sought me. And I was established in my kingdom and still more greatness was added to me. That's scripture. Was he in danger? So here's the point. It's not those things that were the problem. It was his perspective about those things that was King Nebuchadnezzar's problem. You live in a single wide trailer? Keep your right perspective. You live in a mansion, a palace with servants and a world, the known world under your authority and all the birds And the beasts were under his authority. That's scripture. God did that for him. That, still God's hand. Still God's doing. So it's not what you have or you don't have that's the issue. It's not the good stuff that was the issue. It was not the majesty and the splendor of being the king of Babylon and ruling all of this stuff and having lords and servants. That wasn't the issue. The issue was that his heart made him Previously in the chapter, it's all my doing. Now, it's clearly God's doing. He can do whatever he wants. He rules in heaven. He rules among men. He does what he chooses. So the fact that all those things got added back to him wasn't, wasn't a jeopardy, actually. It was actually a benefit to us to look at this story and say, it wasn't the stuff. It was the attitude about the stuff. He had gotten Nebuchadnezzar to the point where Nebuchadnezzar realized, God, you are sovereign over everything. Everything that you allowed me to do is your good hand. Everything I have, your hand. All the nations I conquered, your hand. The day will come when you're going to remove me, this head of gold, and there's going to be another kingdom after me. That's your good hand, God. You do what you choose to do. You are sovereign. Verse 37, the last one for this section. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven for all of whose works? His works. For all of his works are right and his ways are just and those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. 
So some closing verses. First Chronicles 29. I think last week I said Corinthians and it was actually Chronicles. So forgive me for last week. Um, this one, First Chronicles 29, verses 14 and 16. We'll skip over 15. This is David, the context here. David, um, they are ready to build the temple. And David has amassed all this stuff from the people. And here he is speaking to God. But who am I and what is my people that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you. And of your own, we have given you. Stop right there. All this stuff that we brought in to build this temple for you, Lord. It's all your stuff already. So all we're doing is bringing stuff that you already own, and we're giving it to you who already own it anyway. That's what, that's what David is saying. We need to remember that. When we, when we take stuff back there to that offering box, or we give online, we're giving back to God what's already his. There should be no padding on the back. None. It's his. We're just doing what he told us to do with what's already his. Lord, who are we that we should be able to give back what's already yours? That is so strange of a perception, but it's the truth. And then verse 16. O Lord, our God, all this abundance that we have provided for building you a house for your holy name comes from your hand and it is all your own. All this stuff that we brought Lord, we acknowledge it's already yours. Ain't nothing big about David. What a good heart he had. Psalm 16, verse 2. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. When people say, isn't God good? It's true. Is there a verse for that? Well, yeah. Psalm 16, verse 2. There is a verse for that. God is good. He is good. And many, many verses just like it. Then there's Romans eleven thirty six. <laughs> this leaves nothing out. I love this. I love them all. <laughs> Romans eleven thirty six, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. And then Psalm twenty four verse one, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all those who dwell therein. And I love the one that says he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And I always follow it up based on those verses that we just read and say he also owns the continents that those hills sit on and the earth that those continents occupy and the universe that the earth sits in. It's all his. He breathed it all into existence. And yet, in spite of how big and massive and powerful he is, he cares about Bob. Bob's a knucklehead. Bob didn't deserve his love. But I praise God that the time of the Gentiles led to this chain of things that happened that led to me getting saved in a dorm room. He saved Nebuchadnezzar. This guy was mean. He was terrifying. He was used by God to bring judgment on the nation of Israel. He burned the temple for crying out loud. God's home that David had, had just said, look at all the stuff that we brought to build you a house. Nebuchadnezzar burned that down. And God saved Nebuchadnezzar. I was a bad guy, but I wasn't Nebuchadnezzar. So certainly if he could save Nebuchadnezzar, he could save me. If he could save Saul, he could save me. He could save you. He is sovereign. He is good. And we're going to close with, Kathy, you, you, uh, I told you about this years ago when, when I talked about for benediction, Hebrews 13 struck a chord with me. And you said, how about one day having us all stand up and read it together? Well, I didn't tell you to put the words up there, so we're just going to wing it. Y'all can stay seated if you want. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20 and 21. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Christ Jesus, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. There is nothing about that verse. 
that says, I have any ability. If he's given me a gift, it's he that gave me the gift. If he's given you a gift, it's he that has given you the gift. And he wants you to use that gift under his power for his glory. Not for you. Not so that you can say, gosh, look at the gift God gave me. Don't I wield that sword well? That's not... Congratulations, you just got your reward. (laughs) I want a bigger reward than that. I want him to say, well done, good and faithful servant, with whatever he has given me. Whatever talents he's given me, whatever things he's given me. And I pray the same for you. Let's pray. Lord, I praise you for what you did, as hard as it was for King Nebuchadnezzar, Lord. What a story that we can take to heart about how you view pride. And I praise you, Lord, that it wasn't a story. This happened to a king that ruled the modern world at that time, ruled the world at that time, until he could acknowledge that you rule in the kingdom of men and that you do whatever you will you give it to whom you will you take it from whom you will lord you are still that god you are still sovereign you give rulership and authority to whom you choose for your purposes you give us things lord individuals for your purposes lord whatever you have given us whether it's much or little I pray that our hearts would be about knowing you and being known by you. That you would use us and the stuff that you have given us, the gifts, the talents, the things, that we would dedicate them, that we would lay them at your feet for you to use for your glory, to draw the lost to the cross. Thank you that you are sovereign. Thank you, Lord, that you are trustworthy. You are faithful. We give you the praise and the glory for who you are and how you work mindily. Help us to never say, what are you doing in my life? But help us to always trust. Glorify yourself in Jesus' name. Amen. Blessings.